rendering any specific and personal medical, financial, legal, counseling, professional service, or any advice. You should seek the services of competent professionals before applying or trying any suggested ideas. Good morning, truth seekers and true crime junkies. Here we are back with another episode of Hit the Road, Jack, Finding the Zodiac. My name is Nanette, and we left off last week with the murder of cab driver Ray Davis. We're going to climb right back into the presentation and finish out the information we have on him and move forward um, towards the Zodiac era. We have some interesting information for you today, and hopefully there's a... um, there is a drive for individuals to put these connections together or at least reach out to um, those that be that can actually have um, somebody take this case seriously, the evidence that we have on Jack and investigate it thoroughly. Um, we're going to talk about fingerprints again and palm prints and communications. So um, let's go ahead and look back at the presentation on Ray Davis. I will brief you once again on that murder. Ray Davis was killed on April 10th of 1962 in Oceanside, California, very much in an elite neighborhood, just like the Presidio and uh, the Pacific Palisades in San Francisco, um, where another cab driver, Paul Stein, was killed. Uh, Ray was 27 years of age. He was a cabbie in Oceanside, California. At 11.10 p.m., he notified his dispatcher that he had picked someone up and was on his way to a location in South Oceanside. However, his body was found early the next morning in an upscale neighborhood. Uh, Ray had been shot twice from the back seat of the cab, once to the back and once to the head. His body was dumped in an alley and the killer escaped the scene in the cab. So I don't know if everybody recalls the L.A. murders that we had discussed during the Black Dahlia era. And there was indications that um, on several occasions, actually, that the suspect had taken the victim's vehicle and they would find it a few miles away in L.A. somewhere. So, again, this is very consistent with the behavior of the what, who I believe is the same suspect as the Zodiac. So um, it says that his body was dumped in an alley and the killer escaped the scene in the cab. And we'll show you here in a couple minutes the distance in which it was left. But um, his body was dumped in an alley and there was no evidence of a robbery, no sexual molestation, and no witnesses. Now, I'm not quite sure why somebody threw in their sexual molestation. We're talking about a grown man here, not children, not women. Um, was there some indication at some point that there was sexual molestation of some of these victims? Uh, I haven't really seen a lot of that. Typically speaking, they talk about a sexual um, uh, violence of using some type of uh, device to complete that sexual molestation. So it isn't actually a sexual act by the individual. Ray Davis's killer called the police actually beforehand and warned them that he would soon be committing a crime. And he called it a baffling crime. So obviously he wanted to awe and shock and he wanted to keep people running around in circles, not really knowing what to do with themselves. But not long after Ray was killed, the killer called again and threatened to kill a random bus driver. So the reason why this got brought to my attention is during this research of Sherry Jo Bates, we found I, I skipped across this on some websites and we'll look at some of their information as well. This is back in 1962, so we did actually go backwards in time at this point because I did not find this until I was introducing the Sherry Jo Bates information. Um, so we're back in 1962, four years before Sherry Jo Bates, but two years before the Johnny Ray Swindle murder, the radio, ham radio um man from the Navy. So it, it's kind of following this little procession on through the years and one connection to the next. Um, 
There are similarities between the murders of the Zodiac Killer and Ray's murder. Number one, we had the shooting of a cabbie to death in the wealthiest neighborhood of a city, just like Paul Stein. He called to say he would commit a baffling crime, and he called the police to take credit for the murder. He contacted the police to warn of future murders, and he claims he will kill a bus driver. So we know that in the Zodiac ploy, there was not only a cabbie, but also a bus was mentioned. Openly stating his intent was to baffle the police, and I believe that the shock factor and the having fun with the police was definitely Zodiac 101. He's displaying no obvious motive for murder. So um, this leads us again right back to some of the victims in the Zodiac case. Some people think that Ray was killed by the Zodiac. Others think that the Zodiac learned of the Davis case and decided to copy it. I don't see Jack or the Zodiac being a copycat of pretty much anything. And even though he would say he'd do things like use a bomb, he would then quickly recant that when somebody has used a bomb to make sure that they understand that that was not his intentions, that he was again just baffling or having some fun with the police with that statement. In a letter from the Zodiac in 1971, he claimed he had many undiscovered victims in Southern California, and one of them could be Ray Davis. I'm not the only person who thinks this now. Um, some of the information I was able to find from Steve Hodell's site, including this clip of the bear death threat call in cab driver slain. So obviously Oceanside, California ran a uh, newspaper on Monday, April 16th, 1962, talking about this actual phone call that occurred. Um, Steve Hodel quotes, the suspect calls the police and threatens to commit an unsolvable murder. Now, we know that the Zodiac thrived on it being unsolvable, that he couldn't be caught. They had no evidence. He was very, very confident in getting away with the crimes he was committing. A day later, he then shoots the cab driver, Ray Davis, age 29, from the rear seat, then pulls the body from the cab and leaves it in an alley adjacent to the former mayor's residence. Now, this is ballsy because we do talk about some of the places that the victim's bodies have been left out in the open publicly for people to see. Um, even in the attempt of leaving the body, you would have to consider the fact that the suspect could have been seen because he was doing it so public and so openly next to the mayor's re residence did not shock me. Now, of course, I'm not sure who the mayor of, of um, oceans, uh, the Oceanside area is at that particular point in time. Uh, I probably should have done some research to look that up and see how it fits in, but I got myself caught up in a rabbit hole on Nixon and some um, interesting um, connections that Nixon had and how that played into some of the stamps we saw come out in the Zodiac communications, which we will talk about um, at some point. The suspect then calls police after the murder and threatens to commit a new crime, and this time promises he will shoot a bus driver. The exact phone quote from Oceanside Police Department reads, Do you remember me calling you last week and telling you I was going to pull a real baffling crime? Even the linguistics on that is very Zodiac. I killed the cab cab driver and I'm going to get me a bus driver next. Again, language that I feel when I read it is very, very similar and rings that Zodiac bell. He also puts up um, the question, does Oceanside murder weapon ballistics match to Northern California Zodiac Faraday Jensen murders? And his quote is, Ray Davis was slain with a 22 caliber weapon identical to San Francisco Bay Area Zodiac murder victims David Faraday, age 17, and Betty Lou Jensen, age 16, who were accosted and shot on 12-20-68 in Solano County, Vallejo. So basically he has pulled an excerpt, it looks like from CBS News, and they had ran uh, some, some information in regards to the ballistics uh, and the cases that were found. And it looks like um, at one scene, five 22 casings round at, or sorry, found at scene were turned over to the RO and the crime scene at the crime scene. And then four 22 caliber casings found at the crime scene of the Benicia Police Department um, talks about some of the damage pellets that were retrieved from it. So they must have been able to make some comparison to these pellets as well. I would not, I would not, well, I would tend to um, believe that they actually process, not just the casings, but these pellets too, in order to make that conclusion. Uh, and then that in that, then they could literally say that the same ammunition was used for both murders. 
He also presents a map showing the distance from where a victim was shot and placed in the alley to where the his car had been uh, stolen and abandoned just 1.6 miles away. So it looks like the taxi cab driven by Ray Davis was found in the alley of the 400 block of South Pacific Street. And now we kind of have this little rhyme and rhythm of working in alleys, too, because we know that Sherry Jo Bates was found in an alley. And then the body of Ray Davis was located in the alley of 1926 South Pacific. Pacific Street. So while there are other individuals, and if you're not familiar with Steve Hodell, he is a former LAPD officer. While um, he believes his father was the Black Dahlia murderer and he has extended that into the Zodiac, it seems that he has a bit of a problem getting the police department to take him serious on this or making any closures in this case. And I would have to believe that he had some handwriting from his father in order to make the assertions that he has. While I know that his handwriting expert has connected the murders of Lipstick and Black Dahlia and the Zodiac Killer all in one, I find that his father would be far too of advanced age to have been the Zodiac Killer and clearly did not match the composite. So whatever it is that is going on on that side may be just another way to disseminate information or the Holly Weird camp, as I like to call it. So basically, let's climb into a summary of the Sherry Joe Bates, possible connected murders, and the Zodiac Killer connection. Uh, these are some of the things I tallied at the end. It says Zodiac's radium theory uh, falls right through Riverside, California. So no shocker there. Handwriting examination identification has been completed by myself in the Sherry Joe Bates uh, letters, and I will be showing a final comparison chart with all the handwritings examined in this presentation. The identification of the Sherry Joe Bates letter was also made by Sherwood Morrill. There was a um, there was there was an individual from the postal department who later determined. Well, it, it, at first he said it was a match. Then he came back and said it wasn't a match. I, again, have some feelings about the postal department since we know that Jack was getting things around um, in a manner in which if we attempted to send mail out the way that the Zodiac or, or these crimes had been done, they would have been returned. To whom? Who knows? Maybe they would have sat somewhere and never actually made it to any location. Um, however, I tend to... Um, I tend to place little emphasis on the uh, non-identification that was made there because it was then set to the FBI once again for a third opinion. And that third opinion stated that there was a lot of manipulation and disguise in the handwriting, but that there was a probability that these letters were written by one author. Now, let's not forget the fact that aside from doing the handwriting examination, there's also the linguistics, and the linguistics are a match too. So on many levels, these communications from the way they were addressed to the way they were stamped to the way the linguistics are to the way the letter forms and the use of the disguise. So we're going to be talking about that when we look at the final presentation because the use of disguise is consistent. So if he disguised his letter D one way in one in one crime spree, we can see almost an anniversary use of that many years later in another communication, in which case he's using that same exact disguise. Now, it might be one thing to find five or six characteristics from me to you that might be consistent between our handwriting, but the way we disguise or manipulate our handwriting should also be its own telltale tell factor. So we need to not only look at the comparability of the natural writing, but also the manipulated handwriting of these communications and how they actually um, mesh themselves or weave themselves together. So aside from that, we have Sherry Jo Bates went to school with Cecilia Shepard at RCC, who becomes a later Zodiac victim in the next two years. And this might confirm the contentions of Harriet Solves that indicates these two girls were targeted because of things they did or know, knew. Um, there was a phone call to the police after the murder. Now, I've not really heard about any phone calls ahead of time in regards to these murders, uh, though we'll we'll be continuing with that research in the Zodiac case, and, and I will be trying to consume as much information as possible to determine if that was something that the Zodiac did. Um, however, that doesn't really put Ray Davis's murder out of touch if there were no letters 
written in the in that particular series that may have been his way of identifying or letting people know that the murders that are going on that are unsolved right now are in fact him. We have uh, multiple messages written to the police, to the media, and to the victim's family. We do see this throughout the Zodiac and other communications. The overkill and nearby section of Sherry Jo Bates obviously um, shows the the hatred for for they say women. I tend to believe that these are more targets and that this was more of a sign that was being sent um, for people who were involved in whatever was going on. We had the manipulation of the automobile for Sherry Jo Bates and then the moving of a victim's car, which once again, like I said, is very consistent with the L.A. murders that we talked about in the 40s and 50s. Claims there will be more. We do see a lot of that in these communications. Um, in fact, these actual murders that we just talked about within this time frame was by knife, by gun, by rope, and by fire, if you take into consideration Edwards and Domingos, where he, he attempted to set the shack on fire. The cabbie is shot from behind and the killer warned police before beforehand and took credit after claiming a bus driver next. We have a Na Navy radio man and his wife ambushed by a sniper, then finished off at clo close range by a 22 long rifle. There's a missing Timex um, of Mr. Swindles, which he was a painter as a side job to earn extra money. So likely we would have seen paint spatters on that watch. However, it was missing at the crime scene from Mr. Swindles um, arm. And we do find a similar type watch that is left at the scene of Sherry Jo Bates, which brings me back to another question as to whether or not this watch was ever processed for DNA. If this watch is still in with, well, I say if, we know that in most of these cases, all of the evidence is missing from the police departments. Um, I know that there are records, there are things on file. I mean, you don't just do an examination of, I think, 32 fingerprints and then dump the, th the fingerprints somewhere or lose the fingerprints. I mean, clearly that should be there even if they don't have the actual evidence from the uh, victims. Um, anyways, Edwards and Domingos was killed with the same ammo as Swindle and the Zodiac victims. Ray Davis was killed with the same ammo as um, Zodiac victims as well. And the military connection, the ammunition connection, Lover's Lane connections, and cabbie connections. We have unknown relation to cases known for um, of people known for being mob, communistic, and underground syndicate activity. To date, there. Th so I, I really went back and I kind of took a toll of what it was, even adding these new murders that I found, where we were sitting at by the time we were done with uh, Sherry Jo Bates. And to date, there are three Northern California murders by October of 1966. We have 24 Southern California murders. That might describe a whole heck of a lot more. I mean, of course, Sherry Jo Bates is one of those 24. That would leave 23 uh, unaccounted for and may literally be what the Zodiac killer is talking about when he writes LA Times and says that you've stumbled across my Riverside activity, but there's a hell of a lot more down there. And 23 would be a hell of a lot more, but mind you, this is literally over an approximate 22-year time span. We also have 32 out-of-state murders and one Canadian murder. So in total, we're looking at this point at 57 murders. Um, as we move into the um, the Zodiac era, this would actually conclude what I felt from the beginning when I began this case. After reading the numerous communications, understanding the murders that were at hand, I felt that the Zodiac killer did not just wake up one day and become a killer and write numerous, and I mean extensive, communications, two and three different communications to different entities, and sometimes two and three pages long, without having done this before, and then to fall off the face of the earth and never to have done it again. None of that made any sense to me. If you've gotten away with it for that long and that many communications, then you're either good or you have help. So that brings us into 1967, and we have the murder of Nikki Benefit, uh, Benedict sorry, at the intersection of Carriage Road and Poway Road in Poway, California, which again is the Riverside area. So we know that in 66, late 66, Jack had already made it back to California from Texas and that he was staying with his brother while looking for for Doris so that he could remarry her or marry her, 
whichever you see. It, it, the, the contention is, or at least per Stephen Dewhurst's book, is that he married her but was not divorced from Letha and thus um, had to, that was annulled and then he had to remarry Doris. But that is not information that I was given by Doris. Um, in fact, Doris had only indicated that she married after they had removed or, or had come back to California. And then there is evidence that shows that Jack's first wife, Letha, had filed for uh, an interlocutory degree, um, decree in 1965 due to extreme cruelty. And we know that at that point in time, he was in Texas with Doris and obviously living another life with her and her children instead of being back home with his wife and his four children. Um, so it looks like the second murder in Poway, actual, actually. So we had Rochelle Glusecoder in uh, February of 1946, if everyone recalls. And 46? I think that's supposed to say 56. I'm going to go back to verify that. But I know that that was literally, oh, no. That was literally, I think my date is off there. Anyways, um, we did have that little girl that was killed and found in a red dress, which I keep trying to make that connection between the desktop poem and the individual that was killed or stabbed and wearing a red dress. <clears throat> um, Nikki Benedict, however, was stabbed to death by two stab wounds to the heart. And this kind of brings me back to the Bay Area murders, the Ardsma murder, Sherry Jo Bates knife, um, a very small knife to the heart, um, very quick. Most people weren't even aware that the individuals were stabbed. It has done so fast. Um, witnesses claim the knife wasn't very big, but it had a wooden handle and tiny little bumps. Um, I wondered if those were rivets based on the drawing that I saw on CBS. It looks like it's a CBS Channel 8 again here uh, that I have at the bottom. We can see the hand of the individual. And I believe this was the little boy that was familiar with Nikki Benedict on that day. And he had also seen the knife. So he was attempting to replicate that knife. Um, Bob Fisk is a well-known butcher in Poway in 1960s and 1970s. He had these types of knives in his store and he sold them in his store. So this is something that the public could have gotten access to. Um, but I think that that's kind of where they, they looked to when it came to this particular knife. Mariana Benedict was her sister. Um, was still continually trying to figure out what happened to her sister. They did show that she was not sexually assaulted. So again, we have a child murdered with no sexual assault. That always kind of boggles me. I did not find a lot of information on Nikki Benedict to find out um, as much as I could about her parents, what they might be involved with. She is portrayed here with a white rabbit. Um, I'm not sure if this is why we start to see things that come about uh, in regards to rabbits with the Zodiac case. I think a lot of people have kind of played that notion off on something like Alice in Wonderland. We've got my little my little um, cat back here looking as vicious as can be. Um, I think that everybody tried to play that into Alice in Wonderland, though I do see a lot of um, unique tie-ins. And again, it is a media style uh, uh, movie that was a book that became a movie that um, I think some things were knit and picked from, including things like the time and the watches and, and things of that nature. But we are going to hear more about White Rabbits. And I believe that this is likely why this picture was produced with Nikki Benedict in it with a White Rabbit. So that may very well be why we see the introduction of White Rabbits into the next communications that we're going to be looking at. So um, the knife is drawn by the witness and shows rivets. Looks a lot like the one described by Hartnell at the Lake, Lake Berryessa crime scene in 1969. Nikki's picture shows a white rabbit. That equals our dear draft board letters we're about to come up to, the Zodiac, and much more. So on September 25th of 1967, the FBI actually moves a field office into Sacramento, California at 2020 J Street. Um, covered the Fromford case wh where Lynette Fromm, a Manson family member, tried to assassinate President Ford. Um, we, we'll, we'll talk about that at a later time because, of course, we're going to come up to letters that also include things like Patty Hearst, and we're going to talk about some of the Manson family um, murders that occurred after the Tate murders. 
So our first communication today is the, I believe it is the communication that accompanied the cursive written envelope that is portrayed as a fourth envelope by Tom Voigt, but clearly no letter is explained why there is or isn't a letter with this envelope, how he came across it, who gave it to him, um, or, or, uh, who had even made any type of an identification on this particular envelope. I have made an, uh, an identification on it. I do find that there are several consistencies within the cursive writing that are consistent with Jack's cursive writing. And then of course we see at the bottom left-hand corner, attention editor, which is clearly something that we see a lot in regards to these particular communications. So this letter reads November 1st, 1967, which is literally an a anniversary, a one-year anniversary. And we're going to start getting into these anniversaries again because we talked about them in Bauerdorf, where one year later we found or they found the typewritten letter claiming the murder and stating he would turn himself in. This one is more or less like the concerned citizen type stuff. Um, the accomplice who wants to tell all and help catch, catch the killer. Uh, this one read to me a little bit deeper into the, um, the mind of the killer because I do believe that the suspect wrote this. It is typewritten just like the original confession letter to, to the Enterprise and the police department in the Sherry Jo Bates case. And it says to the editor, your human interest story on October 1st, 1967 about Sherry, the RCC girl that was killed was very threat interesting. Perhaps a story about the boy that killed her could be more rewarding. Unbelievable. If people were to read of the life of a boy that turned killer, they might stop to think about the lives of their own children. Are we laying the blueprint for another killer? Might be one of the questions brought to mind by such a story. With hope, Patricia Houts, fellow student. So my information at this point in time indicates that... Um, Patricia Houts was nobody that they could actually find. I do note that on the desktop poem, we had an RH as the sign off on the bottom. Don't know if that is any relation to a Patricia Houts or how uh, those, those letters came up as the sign off. But um, to note fellow student, we are going to see this type of language in additional letters that, that come. And it's almost as if they're attempting or they're, they're stating they're attempting to help. I mean, with hope, what does with hope mean? Um, literally, you're saying uh, if people were to read of a life of a boy that turned killer, they might stop to think about the lives of their own children. Are we laying the blueprint for another killer? Which literally tells me that this was a design. This individual didn't grow up just to be a killer, um, that others are laying the blueprint. So who are the others and what is that blueprint? Um I also note that this individual believes that the story of the killer is more interesting than the story of the killed, albeit um, the story of the person killed and the mystery behind that is what sold the newspapers, is what made the documentaries and the movies and the things that made um, Holly weird, the money uh, revolving around these mysteries. So I think that there are several instances in which the suspect has clearly stated right after finding out a story has been produced about him that it would be more interesting to know my story. It would be more rewarding. It would be um, it would be more wanted. It would make more money, even in some cases, uh, if if the killer was allowed to tell his own story rather than allowing everybody to believe the um, flim flam that the media is actually shoving down our throats. So compared, comparing this still needs to be compared to the typewritten letters. I haven't had very good copies, and that takes away a lot of the ability to be able to literally examine the type print on these particular documents and to find consistencies. Not to mention that we know some were done on teletypes. It also looks like some were done on typewriters. But uh, the November 1st, 1967, Patricia Houts, anonymous letter. And Houts, actually, I did find a relation to a Houts back in Michigan, which kind of leads us back to the Chicago area. And I want to say it was a B. Houts who won the um, a math thesis of some sort back in the early 
gosh, 40s or somewhere around there. I think somebody even actually came up with his name as a solve to the last 18 characters of the 408 that was not solved. Either way, um, some of the consistencies, it's sent to the editor, just like the Zodiac. It references um, this to to tell the story about Sherry Jo Bates. Um, perhaps, perhaps is one of those stuffy um, words like shall and, and, and rather that we see the Zodiac using. Um, but perhaps the, a story about the boy that killed her could be more rewarding. So he's wanting recognition, um, perhaps used in the 12-3-1963 Oswald letter. So we see perhaps twice now within three years, four years, basically. Um, perhaps uh, Howard or Spencer, I believe it said. And now he's saying perhaps the story about the boy that killed her. The statement of the boy that turned killer. Jack was 17 years old as early as I could track a murder, but it does not mean that that is his first murder. Um, he is still technically a boy at 17, although they felt like they were men back in those days. Uh, so there may, that may lead to the fact that I'm not um, complete with where his beginnings began. He's warning lives of their children. Um, might starts the sentence again in Zodiac several times and with hope. Um, again, it's as if he's attempting to assist in some way, trying to find value in himself. Patricia Houts, no such student, no, no such student actually attended Riverside. So, but there was a six-year-old that died of pneumonia and was survived by her mother, Mary Houts. Um, her father, Richard Houts, and brother, Richard Houts. Um, maybe a connection to the RH in the desktop poem means this letter is referring directly to Sherry Jo Bates. So it looks like that is probably another piece of information I should look into. But Richard Houts actually would be the RH that we're looking for at the bottom of the desktop poem. So I'm going to make myself a note to actually research these individuals a little bit further. Richard Houts. Um, and then fellow student is kind of like the concerned citizen, a friend and more from the Zodiac. So, uh, a fellow student would indicate that, that she went to school with her. But like I said, once again, they did not find any indication of that. And here we have it. So Harriet Suchet found that B. Houts was the math, Michigan math thesis winner in 1946, who was made public for sending a letter to Albert Einstein requesting his autograph. At this time, Albert Einstein was in the World War II Brains to War program as a civilian working on a bomb and living in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, I kind of did a cross connection to the 1990 Christmas card where the postal keys were found. Also, there's been certain claims um, that the last 18 symbols in the 408 cipher mentions this Michigan math thesis winner. Again, I'm not sure of the truth of that. Uh, blueprint is an engineering term and Jack was prolific in engineering evidenced by his employment and in invention of the machinery for General Electric. So reference to something seen in the media, we're going to see a lot of this. The Zodiac is closely watching everything that is done or said about him. If they have it wrong, he corrects them. If they're not telling the whole story or it's a little off, he wants to assist in making sure that story is told correctly. And this is how the Zodiac was known for addressing his media, like I said, to um, his letters to the media. The letter is mailed on the anniversary of Sherry Jo Bates' death, literally by one day, which also includes Mer Bauerdorf and Dear Mary and so many more from the Zodiac that turn out to be anniversary letters. Now we're getting into what I refer to as the Dear Draft Board letters because that is just basically how they start. Um, this one actually has a stamp on March 4th of 1968 by... Uh, it's in Syracuse, New York, which I also found an interesting relation when I was doing some some checking on um, the statement that the Zodiac made at Lake Berryessa that he had escaped from a penitentiary. When I went through that rounds, I actually found myself into what would be like a mob type instance of running a prison. So basically the, the inmates are the ones running the prison and paying off the guards and everybody else around them while they're making money off of each other. Um, there's ultimately somebody in there acting like a mob boss. That individual actually had changed his, his name his last name. And when I ran what his last name 
had been at that time, it related back to a very experienced um, and well-known news reporter for Channel 9 News back in Syracuse, New York. And obviously my ears perked up over that because we know that we have the Channel 9 newsletter we're going to see. Um, and it literally says Channel 9 News at the top of it. Um, from the Zodiac, and that we know that the Zodiac has also written Syracuse, New York, and then to top that off, uh, the the actual um, idea that that writing the draft board in secure in this particular um, set of communications, all of that kind of wrapped itself up. It, quite neatly around um, Syracuse Channel 9 News and these individuals, but I have that a little bit further in the presentation to talk about. So again, we have typewritten letters coming off the cusp, literally. So this is March 4th of 1968 that it's received. And we know that the last letter we just looked at was November 1st of 1967 that was typewritten as well. This one has lots of very interesting characters in it. So I'm going to start by reading it and then we'll cover those characters. It says, Dear Draft Board, period. I know you're a bureau crazy. So here is my number. 3058476788 period do they let you drive a car i mean can't i can't anymore you know because the road turns into like waves at the beach i haven't taken acid for 6 days out i can't come down and the doctor said i shouldn't because unstable and my friends talking sounding like waves real far away they said physical transferred but that's a way, but that's a, but that's way away. Shouldn't have taken acid again, but Jesus and God was in my stomach and saying about killing like a big cat with furry whiskers just looks at you real scared sometime. Do you know what I mean? I am scared to see psychiatrists once more because fallen apart and put back together again. Sometimes I have a hard time knowing who's talking when it's me. Jesus, it's scary. Nobody can help me anymore. Sometime I see army officer giving me orders then to start to cry. Do you have God who he said thou shall not kill? You don't care. Now, that was very hard to read because clearly the individual is attempting to make it look like English is not their first language. We see this in another typewritten note in the Oakland County child murders, um, including some of these strange things we're going to be talking about here. Um, we do see these spelling errors, which clearly, um, if you can, if you can spell some words, it doesn't make sense that we're, that you can't spell others. Um, in, in the sense that some of the words are very, uh, are, are complicated words. They're not, um, easy ones to spell and you'll see them spell them correctly in one sentence and then, uh, misspell them in another. So spelling errors include double letter errors, which are the letter E errors noted in the Zodiac case. This is actually a report I did provide to the FBI upon request, which was to um, determine the linguistics on the actual report. So I found that the letter E's were in the handwritten versions were actual distractions to make it appear as though the author could not spell when in fact they were inserted on purpose and we could see the spacing around them that dictated that. We also see that there are splitting of words, which is also Zodiac. And as I'm doing a lot of this research, I'm really kind of taking note to the fact that the splitting of words, hyphenating of words, the um, use of these arrows and other things are prime use in editing newspapers and articles. So that does lead me back to thinking that there is some connection between Jack and the media itself. So two word phrasing in Bureau Crazy and Wannabe. Um, this is very consistent with Sherry Jo Bates, where he writes someone will find her. Um, and what's his name is the way Jack would actually write this. Um, it's three words that are actually combined into a single word. Zodiac and Jack. Um, we see the eight being used as the apostrophe. So if you look here in the word shouldn't, we have the number eight instead of an apostrophe. I want to say that there's a couple more in here. Let me see real quick. 
Uh, down here at the bottom, don't care. Uh, again, we have the common, we have no space between the words um, and the number eight, once again, being used in the stead of the apostrophe. Now, I actually found this in the typewritten communication of the Oakland County child murders, the letter to Dr. Bruce Danto in 1976. So like the Zodiac Jack, the author spells words correctly, but then on other lines spells them wrong. Jack's military ID is very close in terms of number configuration. And since we know it, it is not a valid ID number, we can surmise that um, what the author was actually doing was um, giving them a number to follow up after, giving them some busy work, but obviously not giving them the true um, numbers. So I actually put that next to Jack's Navy number because that was the one that had the closest in it. But um, the 3058 and Jack's Navy number actually starts out 358. Um, the following numbers, 47678. Um, really not a huge consistency with the rest of these, but we do see that again, 8279 are the final numbers for Jack. And then of course, as his Air Force number was 18320162, not a lot of consistency there. Though I think that he is trying to make it out like he is with the Army in this particular letter. However, we have to remember that Jack originally came from the Armed Forces. The first number, the first numbers less the zero are the three, five, eight, which is Jack's first three digits. And the last two of the seven, eight are one number off from Jack's, which is seven, nine. So um, I don't know how much closer a person could get to an identification with these numbers, but that is to me just another thing that didn't allow me to exclude Jack from this particular communication since those numbers were so close. Um, the number is too long. Uh, let's see. The number is too long and does not contain the prefix for new enlistments in the Vietnam War. Oh, so I did a little research on this and, um, this particular number is clearly too long for that particular time frame in Vietnam. It does not contain the prefix for new enlistments in the Vietnam War. And it is too long for World War II and before since, uh, they, they max, they max their numbers, out at uh, seven, which went up to, let's see, since the max numbers used were seven, which went up to 9,999,999. So I did find this information in Wikipedia for the configuration and the new numbering system for the Vietnam is listed below. Uh, by the outbreak of the Vietnam War, the Navy realized that the enlisted service number system would require an overhaul as new numbers were running out and repeat in issuances were becoming more and more common. As a result, the Navy called the B series with new enlisted numbers ranging from 10,001 to 99,999. The numbers would be annotated in the format of B123456 with all six numbers a personal identifier. The intent of the Navy was to continue with higher letters of the alphabet upon the exhaustion of all available numbers. This would effectively grant the Navy over 2 million new service numbers. The B service number series was issued from 1965 to 1971. Uh, in 1969, the Navy further activated a D series, which reset service numbers to 10,001 to 99,999. And there was never a C series created. So in 1972, Navy service numbers were discontinued upon the Navy formally abolishing the use of military service numbers in favor of social security numbers. I personally find that numbers dehumanize people, and I don't believe that we should be accounted for by a number, whether we are in the military or elsewise. Um, it literally takes us takes away from the human factor altogether. It makes it easier to, to let these individuals go from our life in the sense that they were just another number, just another number. The balance of this letter actually says, do um, I shouldn't have taken acid this time. Though lots of speed. I shouldn't have taken acid this time, though lots of speed. Sounds to me like he was wishing he took more speed than he did acid. Did you ever? You and me haven't same thinking anymore, so I got to mail this. My hand shaking. Jesus, I have God for now, so I can't leave. Are you hallucinations? like all of us, but when I drove a car, it ran into a barbed wire fence. I have writing you before, so you know 
about the doctor, but that was a long time ago, wasn't it? But Gandhi was right. Do you know what I mean? Are you a woman? Then you can understand. If I sniff this rag of gasoline, I get my head straight. And then it's signed, question mark, comma. And of course, they've redacted the actual name that was put there. So again, information that's being withheld from us, which makes it a little complicated to put these things together. And they're not actively working on it anymore. So I'm not sure why they wouldn't release that information. The suspect goes on to say, P.S. I don't write so good on acid, but it was six days ago. Keeps coming back. So this individual is acting as though he is in the care of a doctor. Um, but it doesn't really stand out to me that he is absolutely in a hospital at this point in time, especially if he's talking about having taken acid six days ago um, and doing methamphetamines or what did he call it up here? Speed. We know that Jack was definitely um, coined for having done speed, using speed consistently to make drives and do other things. And I believe at one point actually making methamphetamines. Um, so this letter actually refers back to hospital and we're going to start climbing into an area where we start hearing about hospital. Uh, a lot of the times the newspapers would print something to the effect that the suspect must have either died, been in the hospital or ended up in jail. And that's why they haven't found him. It's a good excuse to play it off on that. Um, or at least to give some hope to, to the citizens that he is no longer haunting them, but, but Jack and Zodiac is very much still there. So we know that Jack had just recently gotten out of Temple Psychiatric Facility in Texas in 1966. So this could be reference to having been in the hospital and trying to get his brain straight. Um, the reference to acid, we see that again in the Tom Voigt letters admitting to use acid to acid use during the Zodiac killing era. So that is consistent with these letters. The MK Ultra program also used LSD um, and the program shut down in 1967. So this is probably Jack after quitting MK Ultra or MK Ultra quitting them. And he may or may not be in a hospital in Canada as well. Um, I did not rule that one completely out because we did have the Allen Memorial Hospital where MK Ultra moved to in 67. Um, Gottlieb had his residency there. So I had indicated to research the hospital in the Cooper Caper because he in the Cooper caper, he indicates that he was also um, receiving hospitality in Vancouver. Jack was left high and dry by even his handlers, I think. And I think that he did not want to be disposed of. So he started a campaign of threatening to kiss and tell through cryptic messages to his handlers. And this is literally the end of the Riverside activity that I know of that we're going to see in this particular presentation. Um, Zodiac describes his hallucinations in the 2002 to 2003 Tom Voigt letters and mescaline, which is like LSD and an acid. It becomes part of this killer's, my, my belief, part of this killer's MO in the near future. Um, lots of speed. Jack not only used, but um, made and distributed it. Don't care. Typo found in the Oakland County child killer letters. Sniffing gasoline, another way to get high. Um, psychiatrist mentioned, which Zodiac, I'm not insane. And the contact with the psychiatrist in the OCC case. Um, I see army officer giving me orders. Jack was in the armed forces, Navy and air force. The mention of military time, like the Bowerdorf and Black Dahlia era murders and my hand shaking the letter E edition and the splitting of the words and double eyes, um, just like Black Dahlia letters and all others. Nobody can help me anymore. So he is constantly making a ploy for help me. You can't help me. Hurry up. Slow down. Um, nobody can help me. He's not in control. So pretty much um, every letter I state that the suspect wrote, you're going to find something like this in it and every special spree listed herein. And the sign off is a guess who theme, which we're going to see a lot of through the Zodiac as well. It looks like I've come to the end of the presentation for today. We will pick back up with the draft board letters next week. I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. Enjoy your weather and your time before school starts back up. Everyone take care.